Jonathan, and today I'm here to interview Mr. Dick Varney at his house in Hudson Falls. Mr. Varney was a World War II B-24 flight engineer, and today is December 16, 2003. Where were you on December 7, 1941? I was working at the Imperial in Grunge Falls. So, uh, how did you get into the service? It was, it was a shock, it was, but it was not unexpected, believe mm -hmm. me, because we had been heading towards it. In fact, in my opinion, uh, we were, while not in declared war, we were actively in it because we were supporting England. Mm -hmm. We were giving them everything they needed, and then until Japan attacked us, we did not declare war. They attacked us, mm -hmm. and they declared war on us first, both Germany and Japan. So from then on, it was just a matter of time for we all got into it. Mm -hmm. So you weren't shocked, or what were your reactions to Pearl Harbor? I'm sorry, my dear. I, uh, this is ridiculous, but I cannot hear you. Oh, what were your reactions to Pearl Harbor? Like, how well, did you feel? How did I feel at yeah. the time? Yeah. I was outraged, naturally. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were, it was a sneak attack with no declaration of war or anything. They uh, were so long, Japan did warn us, but by the time they got it deciphered, they had already attacked us before we even knew about it. So mm -hmm. actually it was an undeclared war. Yeah, that uh, that to me was the that all raised everybody right. naturally. And uh, but I was I was not a kid at the time. I mm -hmm. was thirty years old. Right. And I had no idea what was going to happen. I was married at the time, mm -hmm. but I had no idea what what the future was going to bring as far as I was concerned because I didn't know what they wanted to do. I don't think uh, anybody relished the idea of going to war. Nobody does, I don't think. But nevertheless, uh, I think you had a level of patriotism at that time that you'll never see again. Certainly we don't have it now. People, everybody was behind it, the whole situation at that time. I don't think you heard anybody wondering whether we should go in or not because we were in. And not like it's not like we had several wars after that, but none of them were a declared war, as far as where mm -hmm. I'm concerned. They're called police actions and all this sort of thing, but the results were the same. People still got killed. Mm -hmm. But uh, in retrospect, I don't know. That's no long ago now. It's a lot of the details uh, are not as sharp as they mm -hmm. should be, maybe. But I can remember most of them. How did you get into uh, the war? Then? How did you get into the war? I uh, was uh, I was drafted in. in uh, I think it was around in April, mm -hmm. and uh, 1940, 43, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we went through God knows how many schools, how much training to uh, prepare us for it. And mm -hmm. that, that to me was, I don't know. All of it, you were waiting for the time when you were sent over there, but uh, finally we did go over. <clears throat> Do you remember what you went through in training? Do you remember what you went through in training? What I went through in training? Yeah. Oh, yes. I was. First of all, you took your basic training, which is just like any Army training. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> basic training. I took that in Miami Beach. Yeah. Not tough duty in Miami Beach. But uh, after that, we were assigned to uh, Air Mechanic School. Okay. And I was <clears throat> there, I was trained to uh, for the B-24 Liberator. And I was being trained as, a, as an, as an uh, aircraft flight engineer. And my job at that time was to, everything mechanical on a plane, was the flight engineer's responsibility. So you were taught everything about the airplane. Right. And then we took from there, after we graduated from there, they sent us to Panama City for air gunnery. And uh, when we came out of there, we also were classified as an as a armorer, too. So then we went to various places. We went to Westover, and from there our crew was formed. Now this crew, when it was put together, was the first time that I had met. Mm -hmm most of these people, the enlisted men I met. Then I went to uh, South Carolina Walker Air, Air Base, and there we met our pilot, co-pilot, navigator, bombardier. Mm -hmm. And from then on, we were a unit. And we stayed together. We trained together, we stayed together. And all our practice missions and everything. Then we went to, uh, Trying to think now. <laughs> In Virginia, Langley, and from there we took radar training. And from there, that was the last duty in this part of the world. From there we flew to Goose Bay, Labrador, and from there to Iceland, and from there to Valley Wales. We flew all the way over. Now, still as a unit, always mm -hmm. we stayed that way. And then when we got there, then we were assigned to our bomb group. And there we went through more training. Okay. It's one series of training, it's all you ever did. You train, 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 train. Finally, when we got to get, we got there, and then the crew got there as a unit, and then we were scheduled for our first mission, and that one, as I told you, was Hamburg. Mm -hmm. And it was a vital, vital mission in the sense that Hamburg had all their oil refineries, mm -hmm. and without that, without that, they they couldn't fly, they couldn't have gasoline, they couldn't have anything. If you could destroy it, because you would certainly limit their supply. It was a very important mission, mm -hmm. and because it was, they had they concentrated their aircraft and anti-aircraft to protect it. So as I said, I, that's the one I remember. Mm -hmm. Believe me. But there is no contrary to what some people may think. It's like a job. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any heroes there because you're just doing your job. You had to. You either did or you didn't come back. Mm -hmm. So you don't have time enough really to, to be scared a lot. I've seen planes go down naturally. And the only thing you look for was to see how many shoots came out of it. Because when an airplane gets spinning, you couldn't get out sometimes because centrifugal force would because you're spinning with right. Kenya, so you couldn't get out. Some of the people didn't get out. But as I said before, I never, never got hurt. It was always the other guy. And the frame of mind that you have is something that most people, you can't understand that. You can see this happening, but it's not you. It becomes an impersonal thing. It has to be, mm -hmm. because you go crazy if it wasn't. But you're just thankful that it wasn't you, you know? Yeah. And 
it's hard to understand. Not that you didn't have sympathy for the people, but but still, it wasn't you. I don't know how to explain it. So mm -hmm. I don't think there's too many too many heroes. You you were doing your job. That's what you were trained to do, and that's what you did. I don't know if that helps you in here now. Mm -hmm. Um. On the phone, you explained another mission. It was over the Rhine. Another mission. Oh, I follow them. Uh, on this discharge, you will find that our missions were all over, mm -hmm. and uh, they were over the Rhineland. Yes, sure. And uh, Cologne, Dusseldorf, and then whatever you can think of. And uh, we hit them wherever they were. In fact, we even hit Berchtesgaden. That was Hitler's retreat. Mm -hmm. And uh, we bombed as far as Austria and Czechoslovakia. So, as you can see, there's all of the, uh, that's the Middle Eastern campaign. Mm -hmm. And for that, you have the, you have the, uh, the clusters drawn your ribbon showing that. Each one of those means something. I mean, yeah. As you can see, Now this one's the air metal. That cluster, each one of them represents another air metal. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, represents another part of, your, another part of the theater, the mm -hmm. Ardennes, maybe. The Rhineland, and one thing or another. That, this is the date. Today is the date, incidentally, I was looking at the calendar. Mm -hmm. This is the date that the Ardennes Offensive oh. started. At the date when they, Hitler tried to, or they tried to break through to the, split the Allies, mm -hmm. they weren't going through the first army, and they did go through pretty, pretty well. And they stopped them at Bascon. Have you ever seen that movie about that? No, I don't think so. And that's where General McCulloch was the commander there, and they had him pretty well surrounded and beaten. And uh, the German commander asked for his surrender. That's a very famous remark <laughs> what he made. He, said, he says nuts. That's general death. Um, That's all there was to it. Right. We saw a video. Huh? We saw a video with that where yeah. they said nuts. Well, that actually happened. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, at the time Patton was racing, racing across Europe to relieve Bastogne. And he got there. But in the meantime, we were bombing. Mm -hmm. We, were, we couldn't get off the ground for about a week when that started because it was socked in so you couldn't take off, you couldn't land. Mm -hmm. And of course, it didn't bother you once you got in the air because you didn't have to see the ground to bomb because you bombed by radar. And uh, cloud cover didn't matter, but you did have to land. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't get off the ground, but when we did, we just bombed everything in sight. Mm -hmm. How, what was the longest that you stayed in the air? Altitude? Yeah. Usually, most of the missions were between, around 20,000 feet. Wow. Oh. And it was, believe me, in the winter time over there, that's about 70 degrees minus centigrade. That's cold. Mm -hmm. But you did have heated suits, mm -hmm. heated clothes. And of course, under those circumstances, you had to, you still had your job to do. Mm -hmm. As an engineer, I had duties at the time. I had to check, make sure the generators were were synchronized. And I opened the bomb bay doors. I transferred fuel. All of these things were part of my job. Mm -hmm. I won't speak for the other people. They had their own jobs. That was what I did. Mm -hmm. Um, did anything ever go wrong during your job? Everything ever go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> it always something always goes wrong. <laughs> yeah, I remember one time we got ready on the IP. I forget where the mission was, but uh, when they load the bombs, 
they have a propeller on the front of it, a propeller on the back of it, and when you drop them, the wind screws the propeller off. When that propeller comes off, the bomb is armed. It won't go off otherwise. But when they load them, they're supposed to put a safety wire through it, each thing. Well, somebody <laughs> on that mission didn't put the safety wires in. So when I opened the bomb bay doors, the wind hit them, and I called the file on the intercom, and I said, I got news for you. I said, uh, I said we got 10,000 pound bombs here that are now armed. The propellers are all off. Any piece of flak coming through would hit the nose of them. That'd be all she wrote. She wouldn't find anything. It didn't, so. But that was, that's one time that I sweated a little bit, I can tell you. What did you do to fix? You couldn't fix anything. Oh, you... We were on the IP. Mm -hmm. You couldn't take any evasive action. You couldn't do anything, and we were flying right through that flag. But when they dropped the bombs, it was fine. That's... What's the IP? The initial point. Oh. That's, that's where you start your bomb. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was one system that they used. The other system, that's visual bombing. They had two other systems. They had one, the bomb by radar, and the other one, they, I forget what they called it, but it was it used radio signals. What they would do was pick a point, say in England someplace, another point far away they could get it in England, and they put a directional beam. And you would fly along this leg, and this one maybe would be giving you a signal. They like da da dit da da dit, mm -hmm. and then this other one over here would be dit da da dit da da. Mm -hmm. So as you came, where they joined, all of a sudden when they that was your target. You didn't have to see the ground. Oh. As soon as you hit those signals together, you you dropped because you were over the target. Oh. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah. Okay, don't to me sometimes, I can tell you. Was your plane ever hit? Was your plane ever hit? Oh yeah, we picked up holes, sure. Flak holes, I didn't pick up any air, any aircraft holes, but flak holes, yes. How? I worried more about the anti-aircraft than I did about anything else because mm -hmm. you couldn't no way you can defend yourself against anti-aircraft. And they generally fire it in bursts of three. They use their 88s, they called them. And they would have different levels. The first one would be 18,500 feet, and another one would be 18,700, and so on three, like, it accepts. And they would try to get your bracket through with a target. And each battery they had, to, each battery of flying aircraft was three guns usually. Mm -hmm. And they, but they had many of those batteries. So when they started firing, you look up ahead, you thought you had a thunderstorm up there. You know what I mean? Yeah. But once again. So I, uh, your plane never got enough damage to your plane. How, how much damage did your plane get? Was it enough to interfere with the flying or? What? The, when your plane was hit, was it? No. It wasn't enough I to. I didn't lose it. I never lost an engine. Oh, okay. I did have to lose the oil out of one when we landed, but it had a hole in the, in the oil reservoir. But uh, the pump and it was strong enough so that I didn't lose the didn't lose the engine. No. I made sure the engines were right before we went up. As long as I had to fly in it. Mm -hmm. That's it. As I said before, I don't I don't make that much of it because there's not many heroes up there. You're doing your job, that's all. <clears throat> but we did have, for flying personnel, we had the highest rate of casualties of any branch of the service. Because there's no foxholes up there either. There's no place to hide. <laughs> But that's it. Mm -hmm. So no one did anyone ever get 
hurt on board? Did anyone ever get hurt on board? We lost, the, not on my ship, but <clears throat> of our original crew, there was a bomb group that was short, a co-pilot and a tail gunner. And we weren't scheduled to fly that day, so they assigned them to that other aircraft from the other group. And they both got they both got shot down. They didn't come back. But that's the only people we lost in our crew. You say it was uh, just a job, but did what did you and your buddies talk about during the what did you and your buddies talk about? What did I worry about? Yeah, what did you and your buddies talk about? Well, that's hard to say. You, you didn't do too much worry mm -hmm. because it's something that, that you were trained to do and, and you had to do it. And you're busy, you're taking care of the duties of the job. You didn't have much time to think about anything else. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think that uh, you always wondered. Of course it does. It could cross your mind naturally. Why wouldn't it? When you look out the side window and see a plane going down, it isn't you naturally you're wondering, you know? Mm -hmm. But as far as that, that's all there is to it. I mean, the, the way the job was, what I liked about the Air Corps was uh, it was hazardous, naturally. But if you went over and came back, you did have a place to sleep. Mm -hmm. You weren't like an infantryman sleeping in a foxhole. Right. But outside of that, <coughs> No, I can't say that. As I said, I don't think there's many heroes flying up there. You're just, because what are you going to do? You, if you don't like it, we're going to get out and walk. Right. You're, you're going where the plane goes. That's mm -hmm. all there is to it. And that's it. So I can't say you've got to take a lot of credit for that. The only thing that you do can take credit for is being able to function under those conditions. Mm -hmm. You take 70 degrees minus centigrade and you've got a murder of work. And if you took your gloves off, it wouldn't be off for mm -hmm. two minutes and your hand would be froze by. Outside of that, that's a part of it. Did your suits ever like malfunction or anything? Like the heat, did it ever malfunction? Or what? Did the heat in your suit ever malfunction? Like oh. something go wrong? <laughs> There isn't anything ever made by man that didn't malfunction at some time. <laughs> but not very often. Did it ever happen to you? Not very often, because you tested them before you went up. How'd you test them? If you had any brains, you tested it. And your oxygen, you had to have oxygen. Mm -hmm. You went on oxygen at 10,000 feet. And from 10,000 feet on up, you stayed on oxygen. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, anoxia is a horrible thing. If you didn't have oxygen at 20,000 feet, you, you could pass out and you'd never know it. Right. It's an amazing thing. You wouldn't even know it. You'd just go to sleep and that would be it. Okay. You know, if you, anything happened to your oxygen supply and if you didn't know it, that could happen. But like anything made by man, sure it malfunctions occasionally. Anything does. Mm -hmm. We didn't have the technology in those days that you've got now. Our protection was a skin of a piece of aluminum was about that thick. That was it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and those planes were were all aluminum, mm -hmm. except for the engines, of course. But uh, they didn't provide much protection. We did have flak suits, flak vests, they call them. I always use mine to sit on, because that's where the flak was coming from. <laughs> but uh, they're very heavy, very cumbersome. And of course the gloves are heavy too. The suit was heavy, as you can mm -hmm. see from that picture what they look like. Mm -hmm. But uh, outside of that, but I can tell you, we went over and we came back, if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. And if you were, you didn't come back. 
Did you have any siblings in the war? Did you have any siblings in the war? Any what? Siblings, brothers or sisters, who helped out in the war? I, I am very sorry that I have to ask you over this, but I don't understand what you said. Did you have any brothers or sisters oh, in no, the war? No, 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 no. Yeah. My brother, I had a brother who went in later in the war, mm -hmm. but I don't think he had any combat service. Mm -hmm. He's dead now, incidentally. Well, I had one brother, yes, he did. He was, he did have some military service. Mm -hmm. the younger brother. What did your parents think of you going into the war? Pardon? What did your parents think when you went in? Were they? Well, my father had to, wasn't alive. My okay. father died when he was 44 years old. Okay. And my mother, well, what could she say? I had, uh, there was five children in the family. Mm -hmm. We have three of us left, two sisters and me. I was the oldest. Mm -hmm. My mother has passed away a long time ago now. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, that was my band up there. Yeah. Did you do that after the war? Oh, I had that before the war. Oh, before? Oh, yes. Yeah, I started playing dances when I was about 17. Wow. On violin. And I taught myself to play. Mm -hmm. wow. I took lessons for a little while on the violin, but then I played by ear from then on. Mm -hmm. and I taught myself to play the saxophone and alto and a tenor, which I still had, incidentally. Wow. I played dances for a long, long time. A lot of fun. <laughs> it was quite necessary then, because we did wages weren't then weren't what they are now. Right. You have to realize that when I went to work at the Imperial, if you weren't late, forget to ring in or out, you got forty cents an hour. Can you imagine that? <laughs> No. You work 40 hours, you got $16 a week. Now on this, you had a family to support. Mm -hmm. It isn't like it is today. <laughs> no. But I did a lot of reading. I'm, I'm not senile. <laughs> And I'm educated far beyond my formal education. Mm -hmm. I've had college courses at Hudson Valley Community College and management courses. Mm -hmm. And I worked my way up so that when I retired, I was an area supervisor. I had 17 foremen and, I don't know, a couple hundred mm -hmm. men working for me. But I did this myself. I'm quite proud of that. <clears throat> I did it by myself. I didn't have any, I didn't have the formal education, but I didn't feel inferior to anybody, and I still don't. <clears throat> it's an accomplishment. It's an accomplishment. I'm proud of it. Yeah. Because I did this on my own. I mean, today, you can't become a janitor unless you got a high school education, I guess. Yeah. I forget the name of the financier who owned the bank, and he never even graduated from elementary school. And one of the questions he was asked was, don't you regret the fact that you didn't have a good formal education? Just think how far you've gone. He said, yeah, he said, I could probably qualify for a janitor job in my bank. And he was right. Because maybe not because I haven't got it, but I think education is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. 
but it doesn't make a poor person good. You've got to do something with it. It's only a license to practice. And unless you do something with it, it isn't worth a nickel. Mm -hmm. But do you agree with me? Yeah, it's true. A lot of people who graduate from high school and they can't read their diploma. And they can't make change for a dollar. And I blame this, basically, on these things. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't allow them in an elementary school if it was me. Yeah. I'd make them use their head. Because if the battery goes out, most of these kids they can't do anything. Right. Do you agree with me? Yeah, it's true. The basic education to me is Getting the elementary thing, <clears throat> being able to add one and one and come up with something other than three. <laughs> I don't know, but that's me. Um, even though it was during wartime, do you have any happy or fond memories during that time? Have any family what? Do you have any happy or fond memories during that time? Not very many because, uh, well, I had my wife, naturally, but mm -hmm. I didn't have any children until after I got out of the service. Mm -hmm. I do have a picture of my family, but, uh, and I, have, uh, I had a son and a daughter. The daughter was a school teacher. I put her through college. Mm -hmm. I have a son who attended up the community college. Mm -hmm. He is a contractor now, doing very well. So both of them did real well. Mm -hmm. My daughter, of course, died at, when she was 24. She had a cancer. Killed her. That was bad. She mm -hmm. had a child that lived one day. That's the only grandchild I had, to my regret. My son didn't give me any grandchildren, and he won't. I can tell that now. <laughs> Getting too late now because he's 50 years old now. I never thought I'd live to see him grow up <laughs> because the men in my family don't live long usually. I seem to be the exception. <clears throat> Thank God I'm not seen now though. <laughs> see, I lost my wife in 82. Mm -hmm. And I've been living here alone since then. You can probably tell that just by looking around. Do you want to know what time it is? <laughs> Did you were married to your wife be, be, uh, during when you were in the war? You were married to your wife, your wife while you were in the war. Before that, I was married yeah. to my wife so, in 1936. So, did you write to her while well, you were every in day. every day? Every day. Oh yes, she's a wonderful girl. Mm -hmm. She was too good for me, but she was a wonderful girl. Yep. Do you remember, oh, sorry, what were you saying? Were you saying something? Huh? Were you saying anything? I thought you were going on. No, I'm here. Oh, okay. Um, do you remember what the food was like? Remember what? What the food was like. The food? Yeah. I ought to remember. I cooked it. Really? Yes, I'm a good cook, believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, my wife liked my wife cooking better than she liked her own. Yes, I know what the food is like. But the difference is, you didn't eat a lot of prepared food. You cooked your own. Mm -hmm. You ate a lot of things that probably you would. You go out and pick dandelions. Mm -hmm. Did you ever eat them? Yeah, I think I tried. I don't think you'd like them too well. They're kind of bitter. Yeah. You don't like them? I like them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we used to go and pick them and uh, clean them, cook them. You made do. You didn't always have money. Mm -hmm. With those kind of wages, you didn't have money. Especially when you're buying a home, trying to get a, keep a car. Of course, the homes are a lot cheaper then, but only not relatively. 
A thousand dollars in those days was equal to at least five thousand or, or ten thousand today, mm -hmm. as far as what you could buy with it. You could buy a home like this <clears throat> in Depression era. I grew up during Depression. In the Depression era, you could buy a home like this for fifteen hundred dollars. <clears throat> you couldn't hang a door for that now. But. Money was something that you didn't have. But you didn't feel deprived in those days because nobody else had any money. Mm -hmm. No, you didn't have, you probably had one change of clothes, one pair of shoes maybe, if you're lucky and you didn't wear them in the summer because you didn't mm -hmm. want to wear them out. I'm not exaggerating. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because you just didn't have the money. But you may do. Was that in the Depression? In the Depression? Is that how oh, it was? Oh, yes. 1929. I remember that day very well. How old were you? You were? About 17 or 18. I had been working for two years. I went to work at 15 years mm -hmm. old with working papers. I worked in the silk mill, Haskell Avenue, Glens Falls. That's not there now. And I never went back to school. I had graduated. My parents, God bless them, they grew up in an era when school was not that important. Mm -hmm. Making a living was important. You went to work as soon as you were able to to help the family. I don't know people on the you can understand what I'm saying and what that means <coughs> because it meant a lot. Right. But. I wish that I had gone to school. I, w I did later on, but I made it without it. But I had to do it my way. I can, even without an education, I can still talk with you on most any subject. Mm -hmm. I won't say that I can any technical subject. <laughs> no, computers to me are a complete mystery. I never used them. But I think I could handle it. But it's not necessary now. Now I don't care. For whatever time I got left, I'm going to take it as it comes. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy myself. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah. I'm not, uh, I have my problems, physical problems, naturally. I have a touch of high blood pressure now, and uh, borderline sugar is not really, both of them are borderline. So I have to watch my diet, and I do, I see food and I eat it. <laughs> so, that's my diet. I figure I got this far doing what I wanted to do, I think I can go the rest of the way. Mm -hmm. During the war, did you, what kind of rations did you have? Like food rations? Oh no, you had a little, not in the Air Force. You didn't, what did you like? Well, you had what did you do for meals? You ate in the mess halls. If you got back, you did. Mm -hmm. Sea rations, the only time I saw sea rations was uh, on the way over. We, ate, we had a case of them on our plane. And if we felt hungry, well, you could eat them. But that's about the only sea rations. That's one of the good things about the Air Force. <laughs> you did get, uh, you got your hot food. Mm -hmm. But you're probably, incidentally, uh, sometimes for a mission, the only warning you got, they generally post it. But then you'd have a, what they call a CQ, charge of quarters, would come along and they'd shake you about 4.30 in the morning or 4 o'clock in the morning, blackout, you know. <coughs> and you got to get ready to go on a mission. Well, that's when my day would start. You may not take off until 8 o'clock. No. But you went and got your breakfast. I went out and pre-flighted my plane, checked it all over. Mm -hmm. You went to your breathing, 
and explain where the target was and how you were going to get there. And they explained that uh, the route they picked out to eliminate as much flak interference as possible. And they told you all this sort of stuff. And uh, after this, uh, I pre flighted the plane. Your crew assembled, you got in the plane, and you took off. And you went up and you would circle around until you got all the other elements of that particular group. Each one of them was color coded for each mm -hmm. squadron. So you would fire your color code, and these other planes then would see that and they would come and join you. And then when you got all assembled, then you took off over the channel. And then you then you started really climbing to altitude. That's a description. From then on, there was nothing else mattered because you were busy. <clears throat> Did you know what you were bombing? Like, did you know what you were bombing? Oh yes, they told us that before we went. And then when we came back, that debriefing thing they did, first thing they did to give it was about three ounces of Irish whiskey. Now the beautiful part of that was, I had six members of our crew that didn't drink. So I always brought my canteen with me, and they took their their, their whiskey, and I poured them in my canteen. <laughs> I shouldn't tell you that, but it's true. <laughs> but uh, incidentally, the bombardier became a Episcopalian minister. His name was Marshal V. Minister, but he became a minister. And he sent me a invitation to when he was going to be when he was going to be sworn in or whatever you call it and uh, but of course I didn't go and we were going to have a get-together it was supposed to be in North Carolina but it was going to be expensive so a few of them crapped out they didn't want to go so they called it off I wanted to go to that one <laughs> Never heard very much from them. I heard from my pilot. My first pilot, when he was getting married. And he became operations officer of the squadron. So they assigned another pilot. We were we were lead crew in our seventh from our seventh mission on. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, I don't. I've explained to you how I felt one thing or another that I don't. I don't feel that you're doing anything heroic or anything like that. You were doing a job. Right. But the job, of course, did have risks. Mm -hmm. Statistics will will show you if you read any of them, you'll find out that they certainly did. Anything else that can help you with? Um, uh, let's see, on the phone you said uh, about the bridges over the Rhine yeah. and how there were people who were close enough throwing rocks at your plane. That was Can you a, explain that? that? That was another mission that I remember. Mm -hmm. The bridges that were making, mm -hmm. that's when they established a bridgehead across the Rhine. It was only about a quarter mile deep. Of the 250 liberators were set up for this mission. And what we had was no bombs. But we had wicker baskets full of ammunition and supplies. And mm -hmm. Food, one thing or another. And we flew that mission over the Rhine at about 500 feet in the air, right down on the deck. And they were throwing rocks at us. <laughs> we were so low. And now we were lead crew in that mission. Mm -hmm. We had everybody that was anybody in the squadron wanted to go on that mission, all the big wheels. Mm -hmm. So you could have 
a full colonel as a co-pilot or something like that, because all the brass wanted to go, you know. Mm -hmm. So we dropped this, these baskets, supplies, in that perimeter, and, but they were so low, half the time the chutes didn't get fully open, they'd hit the ground and they'd start bounding across. You'd see people running, uh -huh. for, running for dear life every place you could look. I remember that one. We lost 25 planes in that mission. Uh -huh. <clears throat> because before we could even turn, we were over the German lines. And they were throwing everything at us. Fortunately, I was the lead plane, so they shoot at us to hit the plane in the back of me. I imagine. I wasn't too concerned about it at the time. <clears throat> but that was fine. I remember that one. <laughs> that part of history, that bridge at Remagen, you know that. We did take that bridge. We didn't, but it's ground truth. Mm -hmm. How how do you feel toward the enemy today? Germans? Yeah. Well, I don't blame them. They're like us. They were ordered to do something. Mm -hmm. What choice did they have? Right. Some of them are a little more. The SS troops, they were strictly Nazis, they were up to the core. Mm -hmm. I didn't think too much of them, but the Wehrmacht were just people just like you and I. Mm -hmm. They didn't care that much for it. I had a German, not a German, but I had a, a British lieutenant colonel I was talking to in London. And uh, that's when the period when they were bombing London with the V2s. That was the rocket bomb, you know, it went way up in the air and it come down. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, a big sign on the building fell down and I stood there looking at it and this colonel was looking at it with two of it. I said, boy, I said, they got that, they said, they got that one? He said, yeah, that happened the day before, but it was weakened so it finally fell down, it fell down on the bus. So, he says, uh, he told me, Yankee says, uh, what do you think about this anyway when you're dropping your bombs? I said, I don't think anything about it. I said, I never see it. It's impersonal to me. Mm -hmm. But I said, I know that we've <coughs> probably killed a lot of innocent people, women and children. I said, they didn't do nothing. <coughs> I said, I kind of feel sorry for them. So he said, uh, he said why? I said, my God, I said, they didn't do anything. No, he said, but you want to remember something. He's out of their bellies is going to come the, the guy that's going to kill my son 20 years from now. That's the, that was their, because the, that happened to Britain, you know. They had 20 years apart, World War I, World War II. And that, that, so he had no sympathy for them at all. Uh -huh. That's the way the British felt about it. Of course, they took a lot more punishment than we did, remember. They got bombing and everything else you could think of. We didn't get that in this country. This country never had that. And their attitude would change a lot if they ever did, believe me. And it could happen today. Mm. With the kind of technology they have today, there's no place in this world that's out of range. And we're not exactly loved in this world. And we did that ourselves. And we're still doing it. We can't run the world. I don't want to tell you. I don't want to tell you my politics. <laughs> but I think that jerk we got in Washington, <coughs> you ought to put him in the same <clears throat> hole they took that Hussein out of. Because Iraq never did it. They, Iraq never did anything to us. Nothing. They never did anything to us. That mm. one you're talking about, the September 11th deal, had nothing to do with Iraq. The people who did that were Arabs. They were from Saudi Arabia. It's one of our friends. They're friends as long as we got the bucks to buy the oil. I don't know. <laughs> this world's a mess right now. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know where the end of it is, and I hate to see you're the people that are growing up in this. Mm. 
And I hate to think what's going to happen now. <clears throat> Do you recall your feelings when FDR died? Do I have hard feelings for what? Do you recall your feelings when FDR died? <clears throat> when FDR died? FDR? Yeah. It's great for that button. Great for that now I see they got some some jerks that want to take his name and the picture off the, the dime and put Ronald Reagan's on it. Oh, really? Yeah. That's what these Republicans are trying to pull now. <coughs> I have no more respect for them than I do for the Nazis. And what they're doing today is ridiculous. And I'm not going to go into that, but... Uh, Anybody that can read ought to know what I'm talking about. You want to, one little thing I will say to you, why I feel this way. As we did have World War I, World War II, Vietnam, and Korea. You know what our national debt was at the end of that time? About $135 billion. Okay. Then we had eight years of Reagan and four years of Bush. You know what our national debt was? No. Almost five trillion dollars. Do you know what a trillion dollars is? Oh, hi. It's the one with a string of zeros from here to Albany. Nobody knows it. Now, you know what this jerk is doing now? <laughs> you know what it's going to be by the time he gets out of there? A lot more. <laughs> Do you think it'll ever be paid? Probably not. <clears throat> I think right now it amounts to something like $8,000 for every man, woman, and child in this country, wow. or more. And he's piling it up. And who is he giving it to? I don't want to get into that. You didn't want to talk about me about that anyway, but I, I just get, I get disturbed. Do you find it hard to watch documentaries on the war today? Like, Do I what? Find it hard? To watch documentaries on the war today, like like watching on TV um, when they show like the war, World War Two on TV. Do you find it hard to watch? No. 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 I what I what I find it hard to to watch it for is is why are we doing it? I can understand that. I don't think I'm stupid, but what are we doing there? How long are we going to be there? <clears throat> Can you see the end of it? No. It's been going on for 2,000 years over there. What makes him think he can change it? You can't. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what the end of it's going to be either. I know there's going to be a lot more people killed before it ends. Mm -hmm. They're doing something that I cannot see any of our American doing. Can you see our American blowing himself up with dynamite and blowing himself up? No. But you can find that with the, the, the Islamic re yeah. re religion, especially with the, the radicals. I wouldn't say that the vast majority of Islamic people are that way, but the radicals are. They're willing to die for it. I don't think we are. No. <clears throat> um, what do you think about what do you think about Truman's decision on dropping the bomb on Japan? Well, I don't think it was necessary at the time because Japan was already beat. <clears throat> so was Germany. Mm -hmm. But I never knew of any weapon that was ever made that wasn't used. It probably did save a few hundred thousand American lives because mm -hmm. they wouldn't have had to invade the Japanese mainland, mm -hmm. which would have been costly. For that part of it, maybe. But I think that we could have done the same thing with air power, because actually they had no defense against the B-29 anymore. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think it was really necessary, but I don't think anybody ever made any bomb that they didn't use.
when they went through this and developed that, there was a lot of worries about that. Some were afraid it was even going to set the atmosphere on fire with the hydrogen in the atmosphere mm -hmm. and one thing or another. They never knew exactly what it was going to do, but they did it. Now what do we got now? Now it's proliferated all over the world. No. And we can't stop it. <clears throat> Why, well, you uh, Truman? I don't know. We had already been in war, what, about two or three years? Mm -hmm. We had lost a lot of people. So had everybody else on our side had lost a lot of people. He was going to save some of them. I guess that's why he did it. We were the only ones that had it. We thought we were. But we had a lot of people in this country that sold us out. They gave it to Russia. Some of our own patriots. If there's a buck in that, they'll do it. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Did you like Truman as a president? Truman? Yeah. He was very direct and very honest which is a rare commodity today. Mm -hmm. He didn't lie to us. Certainly, what we've got now it lies to us. He lied to us for the reason for going into Iraq. We had no reason to go there, mm -hmm. but he developed, he made reasons. Now, I don't, uh, personally, I think he's a, I think it's the Charlie McCarthy for Sheeney. I think Sheeney's actually calling a shot myself. I don't think this guy's got brains enough. Pardon me, I don't know whether you like it or not, and I know what your politics are, but I'm telling you what I think of him. Why would we go into something with have no idea how we're going to get out of it? We didn't learn our lesson in Vietnam. We had no business in there either. Most people didn't do nothing to us. My idea of America is if it's freedom, if people, freedom of choice, isn't it? Mm, right. Well, if they're satisfied with Saddam Hussein, who are we to say no? That's their country. They weren't doing anything to us. They didn't like Israel, but don't feel bad. Nine-tenths of the world don't like Israel. Certainly Russia don't. Certainly France don't. <clears throat> Sometimes I don't know if I do. Yeah. Um, did you ever fly a different plane? Fly in a different plane? Yeah. Oh yes. Well, yeah. training, but nothing, nothing that was uh, operational as far as the war was concerned. Was for some of the gunnery courses, uh, Boca Raton. I, uh, that's where they taught us to shoot at moving objects. Mm -hmm. They'd have a plane towing a target, and you'd have to learn to mm -hmm. lead it properly to get it sure. Did your plane have a nickname? Did your plane have a nickname or anything? Have any name? Yeah, like some, they, like they... No, I know, I know what you're talking yeah. about. No, you will leave that for the 17s. They were the glory oh, boys. They okay. were the glory boys. <laughs> the B-24 flew faster, carried mm -hmm. more bombs, flew higher, mm -hmm. but the B-17 were the glory boys. You had 10 to a crew? You had 10 to a crew in your plane? You had 10 people? 10 people on our plane, not yeah. 24, yes. Okay. Originally, they had a ball turret on the bottom, but when we got over across, they took that out and they mm -hmm. put the radar uh, transmitter on the bottom where the, the belly turret was. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that <coughs> left the engineer free to, to do everything mechanical and the assistant engineer flew the top turret and my plane. How long would a work day be? How long would a work day be? You said you got up at 4.30 in the morning. How long would you be out till? 
Well, it all depends on where you're going, naturally. But uh, I would say we finally took off maybe about 8 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And if everything worked right, you were back by 1 o'clock anyway. Or you, you were back if you came back. What did you do that after? Afterwards? Yeah. Then you went in and had your briefing. Then after that, they let you go and have dinner. What was your briefing? Was they want to know everything that you saw mm -hmm. in the flight. How heavy the flak was, how much fighters, how many fighters were in the air, and anything to do with anything. But they were more concerned with the flak than they were with anything else, and they should because I think we lost more planes to flak than we did anything. Because you couldn't defend against them. Right. But they wanted to know everything about, about, about the flight. And they had the officers debriefing in one group, and they listed them in the other group. And they indeed got everybody's opinion on what happened. Mm -hmm. and that's what they used to plan their next mission. Oh. Then you had dinner? Yeah. It was a. Uh, It was quite an experience. I'm glad it went, but I'm glad I'm not going again. Yeah. Besides, I'm too old for that stuff now. I'm going <laughs> to take it. Yeah. But, uh, I've got to look. I don't know where they are. I know I've got some copies of this. Did you ever get souvenirs? Did you ever get souvenirs? Souvenirs? Yeah. Well, now that's a good question. I, uh, let me ask you a question. Okay. How could I reach the souvenirs from 20,000 <laughs> feet in the air? I don't know, but maybe after. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe afterwards, like if we landed. Yeah, well, after, after <laughs> VE Day in Europe, I was in London when they when they announced that the Germans had surrendered. Mm -hmm. We went back to our squadrons and we loaded our planes up with ground troops, people who had, didn't fly, non-flying personnel. It took seven people on the ground to keep one man in the air. <coughs> that was the ratio. So the people who flew were actually 12% of the, or 13% of the, mm -hmm. Of the fighting force, they're the people that took the beating, not the people on the ground. But, well, these people that on the ground, the service your planes, loaded the bombs, rebuilt the engines, and all this sort of thing. They were ground personnel. They never flew. Mm -hmm. So after VE Day, we loaded as many of them as we could get in the bomb bays, where they could see, and we flew them at 500 feet in the air up the Rhine Valley so they could see the different places that we had bombed. See the railroad tracks all twisted. And you take uh, Cologne. The only, the only thing had, building that had a roof on it was the cathedral. Everything else was nothing. Wow. And uh, that was all the way up the whole Rhine Valley. And they had a chance to see what their bombs did. <clears throat> But of course, that, a lot of them got airsick because at 500 feet it's pretty rough because the plane bounces all over with these thermal drafts and one thing or another. So I gave each one of them an empty ammunition can. They asked me what for, and I told them, I said, you just keep it with you, <laughs> and you, pretty soon you won't have to ask me. You <laughs> <know>. <laughs> um, your first time in a plane up high, did you ever get airsick? Did I what? Did you ever get air sick for the first time being up high? Did I ever get what? Air sick? Oh no. Your first time? Couldn't afford to. But what I did get was I went up one time in <clears> the <throat> cold and I was stoned deaf for a week. You see, <clears throat> you could take a balloon at ground level mm -hmm. and it'd be about that big around. And you tie it up there where you can see it. When you get up to 20,000 feet, that balloon is that big. 
because your air pressure is so much less. But the air pressure inside the balloon stays the same because it can't escape. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what happens to you when you got a cold. Oh. Your, your tubes, your sassian tubes, mm -hmm. you can't clear them, so you can't balance the pressure in your inner ear and your outer ear. So what it does is stretches your ear. That happened to me. And you can't turn back, and it's very painful. You can't turn mm -hmm. back because you, ain't gonna, you can't abort the mission for that. Mm -hmm. That happened to me. That's why I can't hear you today, probably. I can hear you most of the time. Mm -hmm. but. What did you have to do afterwards on the mission when your ears? What did you have to do afterwards <clears throat> when you landed? What did I do? Yeah, with your ears. Well, they just grounded me for a week until I could hear again, and I set up little missions. Well. And then the stupid jerks at that time, when I couldn't fly missions, they had me out there at night time manning machine guns to guard the base. Wow. That was a good thing if it, it was cold in England in the winter time, you know, that is damp. And they have a much longer day than you do in the summer. I don't know why, they're farther north, I guess. And uh, they also have in the winter time, they have a longer night. People don't realize that, but yeah. it's true. <clears throat> so what was that like? What was it like? Yeah. It was damp, miserable, cold. But you get used to anything. It's true, you do. Yeah. What are you supposed to do? And it's just like I tell people. This, there's no heroes up there. You're doing your job. Mm -hmm. You either do your job or else. But every member of that crew has a job to do, and he has to do it. Because everybody depends on everybody mm -hmm. else. Right. Um, where were you when the war ended? Where was I when the yeah. war ended? Liverpool Street Station in London. I was just coming back from a three-day leave. So I got right off the I got right off the train, went right back into London, and I stayed three more days. I knew I was going to catch hell when I did, but I did. So they took care of me. When I got back to the base, they asked me if I had a good time. I says yes. Every day, every day, four o'clock in the morning for two weeks. They had me flying with every pilot there was in the plane. They kept me going, I'm telling you. I didn't say a word. I just shouldn't tell you that, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> How did you feel when the war ended? Relieved. Relieved. But, uh, what were we talking about? How did you feel when the war ended? Well, that time I felt pretty good, but that wasn't the end of it. <laughs> your feeling? <laughs> uh, what were you asking me now? Your <laughs> How's your feeling when the war ended? Oh, well, it wasn't the end for us. That was the only end of the European part of it. <coughs> mm -hmm. We were still at war with Japan. So I went from there. Finally, we came back to this country. We landed in. New Hampshire. And then they transferred us to Fort Dix. And then from there we went to Sioux Falls, South Dakota mm -hmm. to con continue our training preparatory to going to the Japan mm -hmm. or to the Pacific Theater. Mm -hmm. See, when I, when my graduating crew was split right in two. Half of them went to the European Theater, which we did. The other half went to the Pacific Theater of the, my graduating crew. So we were, we were waiting then to see if we were going to be called to go to the Pacific Theater. But the war ended when I was in Sioux Falls. South Dakota. And uh, 
that would be J-Day. And then it was a matter of time trying to get out because they, <laughs> if they were demobilizing so fast that they didn't have enough bases. And I went to Lincoln, Nebraska, stayed there for a while. I went to Victoria, Kansas, stayed there for a while. Finally, I wound up in Andrews Bowling Field in Washington, in Maryland, and I was discharged from there. But uh, it took quite a while, <clears throat> even after that, to get out. What year were you discharged? What year were you discharged? What were I discharged? What year? 45. 45, okay. The war didn't end until 45 mm -hmm. that year. It was in the fall. It's in here someplace, but... <laughs> look, 50, 55 years ago, my dear, I don't remember every detail, you know? <laughs> I think I'm, I remember most things. Yeah. Yeah. Look at it here. This deed was recorded in October 1945. And it was in April that I was inducted. Right on there. All of that's in here. And uh, all of the battles are in here, too. Not all the bases are in here, though. Okay. I did have a another record of that, but I can't find it. On that, you listed all of the missions mm -hmm. and everything. Um. And somewhere or another, I cannot find it. Okay. It's probably in this house someplace. <laughs> well, it's not necessary. I think you have most of the essentials. <laughs> what medals did you win? What medals do you have? The air medal. The air medal. With two clusters. Mm -hmm. And I have, uh, and then the, the battle stars. I showed you those. Mm -hmm. They're listed here. No, as I said, I had reservations about doing this because, I mean, after all, it's not, it's not a very exciting thing. Not to you, it was to me at times, but I have to tell you it just like it is. And I'm just telling you that, that I don't feel that air combat is such, is such an impersonal thing. It only gets personal when, when you've got a, you're flying through flak or you got a plane coming at you or something, then it gets a little bit personal. But outside of that, it doesn't. Because that's what you're trained for and that's what you're doing. And it's not an unusual occurrence. It can happen any time. So, as the guy says, you don't have to be a hero. What are you going to do, get out and walk? Right. You gotta go where the plane goes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I don't pretend to be a hero, I'm not. I just did my job. And I was good at my job too. <laughs> I made it a point to be because I wanted to know everything about that plane that I could. I never expected to fly. Mm -hmm. When I went through Of course, uh, the airplane itself, to be a mechanic, I thought that's what I would be at my age. Instead of that, I wound up in flight status, and I don't, will never know how, but I did. I was in pretty good condition physically, I guess. Not very exciting, but uh, <laughs> that's the way it is.
Do you I don't brood about it. I okay. don't miss it. But I can remember most of it. But the what's different about it? So so much was the attitude of the people. It isn't like Vietnam, where you had people rioting in the streets, protesting a war and one thing or another. It wasn't like Korea, which was a forgotten war. People got killed. But why we were there is something I don't know. In Vietnam, I think, was a total disaster. And then we pulled out of it. So all the people who were backing us over there, they got liquidated. Not very, it's not a very pretty picture. These are the things that I remember. <coughs> Incidentally, my, part of my, has nothing to do with the war, but this is part of my garage sale stuff. This is my workshop right here. <laughs> This is something I didn't know of. Any of you need a desk clock? <laughs> Here's a beautiful little clock. Keeps perfect time. And I've got probably, in there, I've probably got 20 clocks or more in there. <laughs> I fix them. That's what I love to do. I fix them. Cuckoo clocks, I fix those. I keep supply these are the bellows. That's your cuckoos. Mm -hmm. That's what makes them cuckoo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. Well, do you have any questions? Yeah, was this all necessary? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I uh, I have questions. Uh, I was wondering your project. I. <clears throat> I think it's 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 good mm -hmm. if it'll if it will give people an idea of what mm -hmm. what went on in those days. But I don't think that it will make much of an impression because not the way people think today. I don't. As I said, I don't think we'll see the level of patriotism that we had. Mm -hmm. In the thirties, <clears throat> I just don't. You can see evidence of it right now. You people all think this uh, invasion of Iraq was a good thing. Um. <laughs> you, can you, any of you, think of it any reason for us being there? I mean, honestly, <laughs> you're the people that's going to have to live with this, not me. I haven't mm -hmm. got that many years left. And here, when you get to be my age, you look at a lot of things and you wonder, you know? Mm -hmm. Of course, I've seen a lot in my lifetime. Way back to the time of Herbert Hoover <laughs> and before him. But I never see anything like what we've got now. I don't know. You're going to have to live with it, not me. Yeah. Stop and think. Well, do you have any more questions? Or any, do you have any more questions we could answer for I you? I don't or? really have questions, except that uh, I hope I've, if I've given you anything you need, if yeah. I helped at all. Yes, thank you. And I think this is the end of our interview. And well, after the war I had, it was when my career really, really took off, you know? Mm -hmm. That's when I decided that I'm not going to do something with my life, and I did. See, I was a union president, a union business agent, negotiator for the union. I was union president, and then I went into management. 
became a foreman, general foreman, chef supervisor, and then an area supervisor. And that's what I was when I retired in 1976. I did this on my own. I'm kind of proud of that because I didn't, I didn't have the, the tools some people had. I didn't have the formal education, mm -hmm. but I had the brains. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for having me be able to interview you. And oh, you're nice kids. I, was glad. I wasn't going to do this, believe me. Well, I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. But, uh, no, if I...